Theoretical Times, a podcast series between Tara Brabazon and Steve Redhead. My name is Tara Brabazon and it's my great pleasure to talk with Steve Redhead today about an often forgotten philosopher, Lucio Coletti. Coletti lived from 1924 to 2001 and is best known as an Italian Marxist philosopher. So there's probably two adjectives there and a noun, but all three are now questionable, Italian Marxist philosopher. So Steve, why do you think Coletti's career and writings have been marginalised in mainstream philosophy, particularly since his death? It is an interesting case, Lucia Coletti. He was certainly in the late 1950s, the 60s and in fact the early 1970s, probably the most famous Italian philosopher putting aside even people like Antonio Gramsci and Coletti's predecessor, Galvano della Volpe. I think he was a really important philosopher, um, particularly of politics, aesthetics and law in that period. But he's forgotten since, partly because he moved so radically to the right. He joined Berlusconi's Forza Italia, as a parliamentarian in his later years. And that massive swing from, as I called it, Marx to Berlusconi, actually has never really been explained properly. And I struggled in my own writings about Cletty to explain it. But I think that's why he's been forgotten and condemned, that those on the left uh, thought he was a traitor, and perhaps those on the right uh, suspected him. You've raised there, Steve, the profound challenge, I'm assuming personally and professionally, in moving from the far left to the far right. So thinking about all the research you've done on Coletti through your own career, what do you think drew Coletti to Berlusconi? The the swing to the right did actually happen over quite a period. So Mm. Coletti was always anti-Stalinist, even though he was a member of the Italian Communist Party From 1950 to 1964, he even thought about leaving the Italian Communist Party like many other intellectuals after Hungary in 1956. Mm. But Coletti moved steadily, actually, to the right. He moved uh, to the Italian Socialist Party, um, which had a more kind of Euro-communist base. And then eventually, as he grew older, uh, he basically moved into the arms of Berlusconi. But a lot of that was rooted in his anti-Catholicism. Catholicism in Italy is just incredibly important and all aspects of politics and corruption are are connected there. And Coletti fought against that all his life. And I think he thought uh, that at the end, Forza Italia was better than the Christian Democrat Party because of the Catholicism. And... I think that explains a lot personally, but actually politically, he felt that um, Marxism and the left had lost its way um, by the early 1970s. And there's a fantastic interview he did with New Left Review in 1974, Mm -hmm. which explains a lot of that. Um, And that's actually on the eve of his move um, from the left to the right. And he explains that partly because he, he starts to become disillusioned with the ideas of critical theory, what we now call critical theory and uh, left-wing theory. But effectively, but within three years of that interview, it was done in 1974, in 1977 you could say that uh, the left movement, uh, as it had been in the 20th century, was almost over. And Coletti sort of uh, rode that wave to the right. I think that's a really good point. These days, in the 2010s, I think it's very easy to reify or collapse the complexity of Euro-communism and also the Red Brigades, I think. You know, it is important that we do think about the history in terms of its texture and its richness in and of its time. And Euro-communism particularly was a very, very complex formation, particularly in Italy. But also, of course, in France, 
And that leads to my next question about the relationship intellectually and personally between Althusser and Coletti. Louis Althusser and Lucia Coletti are real pillars of what was an attempt to create scientific historical materialism or scientific Marxism in the 20th century. And only looking back can you really see their stature, I think. And they were, I would argue, equal um, in, in many ways. Coletti certainly, um, in the 1960s, wrote to Althusser and Althusser wrote back. Wow. They met in the 1960s and actually kept up a correspondence, which I'm tracing in my research work at the moment. Um, it's long lost correspondence. And I think it'll be a really interesting correspondence to read because they were people of stature. Uh, in terms of continental philosophy. And I think some of the subtleties of all of that have been lost. They were basically the most important anti-Hegelian writers. Uh, and even though you could say uh, Althusser um, perhaps uh, lauded Hegel more than Coletti, both of them were actually trying to show how if you... Um, inverted Hegel, basically you got Marx. Today we don't have that. Someone, a celebrity theorist like Slavoj Žižek uh, is a Hegelian and uh, has tried to resurrect Hegelianism and I think that's a really, really important difference and one of the reasons why we need to go back to the 1960s of Althusser and Coletti. I think also both of those theorists um, made great inroads into understanding what previous theorists like Marx had argued. And they have something to say to us today. They have a great deal to say, in my view, uh, about politics, about philosophy, about law and culture. Um, and they, they're of a stature that people today, people uh, arguing about celebrity intellectual culture today, just some, simply don't seem to grasp. We've thrown out, in many ways, the baby with the bathwater. We've thrown out Althusser because he strangled his wife. We've thrown out Coletti because he moved so radically to the right. I think that's a really significant point, Steve, that we need to recognise that unpopular theory has a role in popular culture. And I think we're after the simple relationship between the Zizek being part of popular culture and mm. simple and clean. And, you know, the, the nature of these philosophers that lived a long life is that they were complex and they were difficult and they were un popular and they were dissenting and so they don't always fit and I think probably our theories of them need to transform rather than we demanding that they're simply part of a seamless popular culture I think. But you talked about the correspondence between Coletti and Althusser which I just love you know I love the sort of letters and the correspondence but we recently heard from the assistant of Coletti's widow. Could you tell us a little bit about what's actually happening to his archive in Rome, literally as we speak? Yes, the Centre for the Study of Lucio Coletti, which actually set up uh, in the house where Coletti had lived in Rome, shortly after he died in uh, the early 2000s. It still exists, and it's an archive. It's also, uh, it also produced a travelling exhibition. Uh, it produced a Centre for Liberal Thought in Bologna, in Italy. It still exists, and it's a really important archive, especially because I want to get hold of the letters between <laughs> Althusser and Coletti for this research. But I think it, it, it actually will paint a much more detailed picture of Coletti um, than we've, we've got so far. But I think what happened is that this archive was tolerated in Italy in many ways, and it did have this travelling exhibition. It came to Britain, um, which was actually quite an important archive exhibition, archive library at the time. But as Italy has developed its own political and economic problems, uh, the archive itself seems to be less and less supported. And the centre in Rome is actually having to move because there isn't now the support for it. We really don't know what's going to happen to that archive and library. And it seems to me, for all sorts of political and historical reasons, important to support it. Uh, but we understand that they will have to move uh, because of the lack of financial support, uh, literally in the next few weeks. It's astounding, isn't it? And it's, it's ironic in a really disturbing but also slightly blackly funny way that 
you know, the global financial crisis has taken out the Coletti archive. It's, it, it is slightly funny, but also sort of horrifying. And I think we need to find ways, as many ways as we can, to support that. But my final question is for perhaps the guys and gals who are listening to this podcast who have never heard of Coletti. And are just listening to it because they've randomly, you know, listened to our podcast through time. They've gone, well, who is this guy? Well, Steve, can you tell those guys and gals why should students, why should scholars read or indeed continue to read Coletti? Coletti is important, I think, for contemporary theory, whether you talk about philosophy or legal theory or political philosophy or political economy for that matter, because he ranged across the disciplines and sub-disciplines, partly by reading Marx very, very carefully and then innovating. He developed out of what he read in the most important uh, writings of Marx, say in Capital or the Grundrisse, um, ideas which actually resonate today. I'm not sure that he predicted neoliberalism, for example. He was mm. most, most important in his writings in the 1950s and 1960s. Neoliberalism basically started in the 1970s. But I think today you could use his explanations of the way that society works, particularly in terms of political and legal philosophy, and, and understand it better. He particularly got the idea of alienation, for example, which yeah. Marx starts in his early writings and, in Coletti's view, carries through to his later writings. Althusser, for example, didn't agree with that. But Coletti argued systematically how the early writings developed into the later writings and still had something to say. That's 150 years ago that Marx was writing these things, but some of those things have a resonance. And one of the most important things that Coletti did was develop them in a really sophisticated way, eventually, so that we could apply them in contemporary society. I think that's fabulous, Steve. And what's so interesting, if we're actually dealing with from Marx to Berlusconi, if you will, that actually what we need to be talking about is Coletti to Guy Standing, because Coletti's theorisation of alienation, I think, is his most important concept and provides Guy Standing's precariat with much more of a theoretical spine than he currently has. So, Steve, thank you for this conversation, and I hope that this podcast goes some way in supporting people returning to the reading of Coletti and also finding strategies to support that archive so that it can survive and those letters with Althusser can survive for further analysis. Thank you for listening to this podcast on Theoretical Times by Tara Brabazon and Steve Redhead. Please feel free to contact us at Charles Sturt University.